due process. Winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2014 New York Emmys for our coverage of criminal justice and current affairs. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law, Newark, and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. If you're a low-level drug dealer or you violate your parole, you owe some debt to society. But you don't owe 20 years. You don't owe a life sentence. Mass incarceration, fueled by a failed war on drugs. A president hopes to reverse the trend with unprecedented commutations, while senators press for sentencing reform, making the punishment fit the crime, reducing the prison population on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding from the New Jersey State Bar Foundation and the PSEG Foundation, making things better in our communities. Not long ago, it would have been unthinkable. A U.S. president, a bipartisan group of senators, and law enforcement leaders from America's major cities, all of them urging a shift from the ongoing war on drugs to a new paradigm, a softened approach to drug crime. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. Now under new scrutiny and attack, what the New York Times calls the harsh, counterproductive policies that have driven America's devastating prison boom, destroyed communities, written off an entire generation of young men of color. It's a movement that's been mounting, though it didn't fully catch public attention until Barack Obama went where no president had gone before. Well, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to meet with me. I know this is the first time this ever happened. A dramatic way to underscore his call for meaningful criminal justice reform. A message he's carried from El Reno Federal Prison in Oklahoma to the NAACP conference in Philadelphia. Over the last few decades, we've also locked up more and more nonviolent drug offenders than ever before for longer than ever before. In far too many cases, the punishment simply does not fit the crime. And it wasn't just talk. Just one day earlier, he'd commuted the sentences of 46 federal inmates, all serving long, hard time for nonviolent drug crimes, most involving cocaine base or crack. I believe these folks deserve their second chance. The Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 had reduced the disproportionate penalties for crack and powder cocaine. And more than 7,000 federal prisoners had their sentences reduced. But many of the Obama commutations involved the more prickly question of pre-2010 mandatory minimums. We have to reconsider whether 20-year, 30-year life sentences for nonviolent crimes is the best way for us to solve these problems. And though the president's freeing of just 46 may seem largely symbolic in view of the massive numbers imprisoned, the 6,000 later cleared by the Justice Department for early release will have wide impact. And it's only the beginning. The U.S. Sentencing Commission changed the guidelines again last year. And their retroactive effect could ultimately mean less time for as many as 46,000 federal inmates, nearly half of those in for drug crimes. The United States will never, will never be able to prosecute or incarcerate its way to becoming a safer nation. It's what former Attorney General Eric Holder calls a sea change in the country's approach to drug crime and over-incarceration. 
For far too long, our system has perpetuated a destructive cycle of poverty, of criminality, and of incarceration that has trapped countless people and weakened entire communities, particularly communities of color. Like the old crack laws, the brunt of drug enforcement has largely fallen on low-income urban blacks and Latinos, too often policed, prosecuted, even sentenced more severely. African Americans are more likely to be arrested. They are more likely to be sentenced to more time for the same crime. But the crushing sentences born of mandatory minimums aren't limited to the black and brown. This white man from Bradley Beach found himself serving a 50-year state prison term for offenses involving not hard drugs, not violence or weapons, but growing and intending to sell marijuana. Even correctional officers in, in, in prison, they couldn't believe it. there was actually a guy in there for growing weed at that much time. And even the judge who sentenced him, bound by the mandatory minimums of New Jersey law, declared the sentence to be simply too severe and difficult to accept. Even the judge himself felt that the sentencing wasn't appropriate or right for the, for the crime. The court was bound. It's the law. The law is the problem. He was bound to sentence Skip to this 50-year sentence. He had just a two-day trial and a lawyer disbarred soon after. But his claims of ineffective counsel didn't get very far until Kelly Smith, a former public defender who just happened to be in the courtroom when Allegro was sentenced, signed on to fight for his release, or at least reduction, while Allegro went on serving hard time in the state's toughest prisons. In Trenton, they jumped me in the yard. Some guys just trying to, from a gang, just trying to earn their... Stripes. Stripes, exactly. And five years into his sentence, after split decisions on appeal, she was able to get him an all-important plea deal. In all, he served seven and a half years before freedom in 2010. So he, he got a bum deal all the way around. And Allegro says he met many like him, serving long terms in state prison, all because of state mandatory minimums, which, despite the advent of drug court for some... I told you you're on trial every day, sir. ...remain firmly in place here in New Jersey. You know, 39 to 42 percent of our prison population is nonviolent drug offenders which is the leading in the country. And despite study commissions and calls for its end, most of the action has been in Washington, where a bipartisan group of senators, including Cory Booker, is pushing for reform of the mandatory minimums for nonviolent drug crime. There are people that have been separated from their families for unnecessary amounts of years. This bill will address much of that. It was all a part of the war on drugs, from Nixon's early push, in March 1973, Richard Nixon authorized the formation of a new law enforcement super agency to fight drugs, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Through Reagan and Bush one. The war on drugs will be hard won neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, child by child. With a ramp up from the Bill Clinton. Will be used to put a hundred thousand police officers on the street, a twenty percent increase. It will be used to build prisons to keep 100,000 violent criminals off the street. But the drugs are still here. The prisons are packed with more than 2.2 million. Young lives are being ruined. And Obama's using his final months in office to say, enough. For what we spend to keep everyone locked up for one year, we could eliminate tuition at every single one of our public colleges and universities. $80 billion a year, 25% of the Justice Department budget, but it's the human cost that may be most troubling. As the president puts it, the United States is home to 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. More than 2.2 million behind bars, a large percentage in for drug crimes, with blacks and Latinos disproportionately represented. For how we got here and where we're headed, we turn to an expert on sentencing and another on civil rights. Bennett Barlin, a former state deputy attorney general, is former executive director of the New Jersey Commission to Review Criminal Sentencing, who continues to speak and write on flaws in the system. 
Rutgers Law Professor Elise Body, who sits on the board of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and teaches civil rights and con law, is the former director of litigation for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go back to the first part, which is how we got here. Um, the war on drugs has been criticized from its inception. Right. Um, there were criticisms of, I remember Kurt Schmoke, Mark Maurer, the Sentencing sure. Commission. Uh, so it's not a new idea to challenge the underlying premise or the deleterious effect of incarceration. So when the Attorney General says we're facing a sea change, is it true? And if so, why now, so many years into this highly controversial and oft-criticized strategy? Well, we've had uh, 30 years of experience, and frankly, we haven't really received much of a return on the investment that has been made by law enforcement in waging this war. Uh, drugs are still a problem. We have a tremendous racial disparity with respect to our sentencing issues. And there's also just a tremendous human and fiscal cost to a war that has um, really shown no dividends whatsoever. It hasn't promoted public safety. And there is a consensus that it has now done really far more harm than good. But if the yeah. cost is measured in lives rather yeah. than in years, that's a huge toll for us to absorb before we get to a serious criticism. Can I, can I jump in on this? Because I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you that the, um, that the strategy hasn't paid dividends, but I feel like we're in a moment here that we, that the public conversation really started to take off when the cost of uh, police killings of unarmed black men uh, became more visible, the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, I do think that that has opened up a window into, the, into this problem um, and has allowed the public to take more cognizance of, of what is going on um, it, you know, in our right. prison system and in the, in the trap doors that exist in our criminal justice it, system. Uh, I think it's brought it into sharper yeah. focus, and I think it's perhaps made more people yeah. aware of the issue, but as you pointed out, this issue um, has been debated since 1973 when Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs. There were people who said, this is the wrong approach. We need a public health oriented approach but ben, to the drug problem. While there were people who were saying that, yeah, yeah, yeah. the American public was not saying, what are you talking about when Nixon, Reagan, Bush all said, yeah. our most serious problem in yeah. America is drugs. Right, absolutely. And the problem that was perceived at the time was the drug abuse, right? This, this wide-scale misuse of serious, controlled, dangerous substances. And there wasn't wide objection there, among the American public. Yes, maybe in the academy there was debate, and maybe yeah, in, in sure. some discrete areas. Right. But in fact, it was an accepted idea. Absolutely. We have to have this war. Yeah, well, until it became visible. Absolutely. I mean, until people had cell phones and they started documenting uh, people being killed by the police uh, and you know we, the problem is that we're dealing with a population that is largely invisible right, right. behind bars we don't uh, unless you are personally connected to someone who is in prison you don't see it you don't feel let it me, let me yeah. press this challenge a little further because yeah. I, I understand I agree yeah. that, with at least that there has been some public discourse although it's far more directed at police violence yes right. the question of sure. whether or not the body politic even now has shifted that is this is a discourse mm -hmm. among sure. policymakers legislators and experts like yourself Absolutely. it's not trickle down so for example in new jersey while there are changes in results we're not changing our statutes right now no we haven't uh, and governor christie despite uh, maintaining this emphatic position from the beginning of his tenure that the drug war is an abject failure has in fact done nothing to change the laws that were enacted in 1987, which caused this massive explosion in New Jersey's prison and population. And we don't expect him to do it right now as he's trying to run for president. That's correct. But in fact, there seems to be an acceptance of this, the kind of questions that we're raising here today that wasn't there before. We tried oh, well over a dozen prosecutors, mm -hmm. sheriffs, uh, legislators, all of whom we thought sure. you know, might well be on the mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. cut back on the mm -hmm. penalties for drugs. Mm -hmm. No one would come on with you guys today. Mm -hmm. Everybody, mm -hmm. nobody said we're not, we don't want to talk about this, but everybody was. So maybe it's more busy. like a schizophrenic episode than a sea change. Maybe, but let me explain something, something very interesting. As you pointed out in your piece, the release that we're talking about was the result of the, the Federal Sentencing Commission making its decision to reduce sentencing for drug traffickers. The reason that the commission gave, and this was not opposed by 
Republicans and Democrats in Congress was that the federal prison capacity was 33% yes. in excess and that the federal Bureau of Prisons budget was inching towards $7 billion, which was unprecedented. So the rationale given by the Sentencing Commission wasn't the human cost, which is critical, it was the financial cost. And that appeals to people or politicians on both sides of the aisle. I, I guess in my mind, I, I understand, and, and you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not a, a, a point that's worth debating, but I do, I do think that the, the visibility of the, of the problem makes a difference in the public discourse. Now what, now what we do with that in terms of the policy makers and the, the statutory reform is a separate question, but I do feel like there is an opening to have a conversation um, that I haven't felt uh, was being had in a very public way around criminal justice generally. Um, and in my mind, that's a hopeful, I you know, opportunity. Well, Elise and I were talking before the program, and I'd mentioned from my perspective as a prosecutor in New Jersey, I felt the sea change take place, believe it or not, in the late 90s when profiling mm -hmm. came to the fore. Um, that was an issue that really, I think, galvanized people, and it understood that there really was a negative impact on all people regarding the enforcement you, of our drug but, laws. Right, but do you think the exposure of profiling, which did come as a surprise mm -hmm. to at least much of white New Jersey right. and white America. Mm -hmm. Did that have any connection to people's willingness mm -hmm. to lock up drug offenders mm -hmm. for long periods? And I don't think no. we can go too much further without talking about the racial impact. Yeah, no, I mean, the racial impact is, is, is very real. I mean, in 2000, 10, 75% um, of people who were convicted of drug crimes that had some sort of a, a mandatory minimum sentence associated with it were African American or Latino. And 73% of those who've now been released under this program are, in fact, right. black or Latino. And so, the, I mean, the, the racial costs, you know, I, I, are, are significant. Um, and I think the, you know, the willingness of policymakers to act on these issues um, is very much tied to, um, uh, I think, some uh, reluctance to be perceived as soft on crime and, you know, what we're willing to tolerate in terms of the human cost on black and Latino populations. I mean, you know, uh, to your point earlier, uh, why does it why does it require the loss of lives over this sustained period before people wake up and say, oh, this isn't working, right? Why does it why do we why does it require and also, that? Also, there's the obvious, which comes out of Sandy's package, which is a black president in his second term yes. willing to talk openly about it and make it an Absolutely. issue. But if our path to recognize the problem has been such a crooked one, mm -hmm. it suggests that going forward having a meaningful policy debate and then meaningful political change is not going to be easy. We have a state governor who's really argued both ways exactly. and no change in the statutes. And there's going to have to be, there is the Smarter Sentencing Act still pending in Congress, which would make some additional changes. Is there really a momentum that's going to lead to a fundamental and systemic rethinking of how we deal with drug activity and what percentage of it is criminal and what percentage of it is health? Well, it's interesting. The federal sentencing decision was actually opposed by organized law enforcement. The, the National District Attorneys Association opposed the reduction, as did an association of United States, assistant United States attorneys, federal prosecutors. But it was really the effort of then Attorney General Holder to rally the troops and prevent that initiative from the Sentencing Commission from being undermined. Because to a line prosecutor, it is tremendous leverage mm -hmm. to be able to sure. say to a Absolutely. potential accused person, you want a 30-year minimum or some other possibility. So, it un I mean, that's not a lofty policy debate. It's a practical day-to-day -day you're in court making judgments. Do you want to give up leverage that may help you do what you may think is just? So my question is, how optimistic are the two of you that the point at which we've reached and the awkward way in which we got here mm -hmm. presages a fundamental change and a rethinking of our attitudes about how to deal with drug activity. Well, I, you know, we do have this bipartisan measure that's been introduced in the Senate. Uh, you know, uh, Grassley uh, being one of the, the co-sponsors, as I understand it. Who would have thunk it? A Republican senator. A Republican senator, a conservative, chair of the Judiciary Committee. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic. Um, I feel like we have to be optimistic, actually, uh, to have, you know, 
any 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 kind of uh, faith in the possibility sure. of, of of future change. I mean, so I I think that's I think that's a significant step. I think the fact that we've had a sitting president um, and a U.S. Attorney General weigh in in a very public way is is a sign for optimism. It's but they couldn't take the risk of doing it in the first term. So clearly, no. the people who who believed in it but had to do the yeah. political calculation thought it was high risk. And and then you cite. Um, the resistance from uh, law enforcement types. That's correct. Should we then be encouraged that 130 absolutely prosecutors, you, um, sheriffs, and uh, chiefs and, and, and directors of police came to Washington and said, "Enough." Well, I can address that's very interesting because I had a personal experience when I was the executive director of a sentencing commission. One of our most important initiatives was to amend the school zone law in New Jersey, which was really a persistent engine of racial disparity. And the one change that you were able to get? The one, well, two. We expanded drug court in 2008, but eventually, in 2009, it's really one of his last acts as governor. Governor Corzine signed this bill to amend the school zone law. Interestingly enough, also made it retroactive, which is so interesting. That's what really what's so unique about the Federal Sentencing Commission's decision. It's not just prospective, it's retroactive. And that, by the way, is, as you pointed out, explains the release of the 6,000 inmates. This has been going on for actually a year. Um, but going back to the school zone, the statistics we had were so startling. 96% of all inmates who are serving prison time convicted of that were minority. Okay, so explain well, why that happens since black people tend to live in cities. The, well, that's of course. It was it was obvious why it happened. But my point because, is this. Wait, no, but, but I don't want to leave sure. that because the school zones are everywhere in the cities. Absolutely. That in the commission demonstrated that using very sophisticated mapping technology. Hence this disparity in sentencing. But what's important is that when that statistic became known, the law enforcement representatives on the commission, I think, really were startled on a human level. And it's interesting that the commission, which was comprised of law enforcement, prosecutors, and police, did not oppose the commission's effort. My point is simply this. We can't all consider law enforcement as sort of this monolithic entity. But let me ask you one horrible hypothetical. Okay. A horrible violent crime is committed by one of the 6,000 or one of the 46 mm. I, who's released. Does the, does the sea change get reversed in the body politic? Just happened. In New York City, you had a detective um, who was killed this weekend, this past weekend. Um, it's come to light that the inmate was a drug court participant in New York. Um, and that the judge had allowed him entry into the New York drug court program against the wishes, the recommendations of the prosecutor. And the tabloids have already started talking. Absolutely. About so, when I was a drug court prosecutor, we had to be very careful about who we screen, frankly, to prevent exactly this kind of adverse. And with uh, about a minute and a half left, sure. let me ask you about New Jersey and about sure. this governor, because we've just received a press release right. that touts the governor's position on reversing sure. the trend toward over-incarceration, uh, the drop in the New Jersey prison population, and the embrace of drug court. And yet you make an important point that you've written about, about drug court, and it, about why that's not really so different. Sure. It, just very quickly, this trend has been ongoing since 2000. And it's been precipitous, it's been continuous. And when we deal with trends like this, it's very difficult to isolate one primary reason. Drug court's been around for many okay, years. Okay, but what's wrong with drug court, from your perspective? Drug court is not an alternative to the drug war. Because That's the you're position. still in the criminal system. Absolutely. It is still a criminal justice approach. You have approach. to plead guilty. Exactly. You have are to be a convicted sentenced. felon. Many defendants who fail out of drug court go right back to prison. All of them are saddled with the same collateral consequences mm -hmm. as any other drug okay, defendant. Okay, with 20 seconds left, Elise, let me give you last word. I think where do we go from here? You've said you're optimistic. Give yeah. me give me five years down the road where we're going. Well, I hope five years down the road, first of all, we'll be, we'll be more attentive to the trapdoors that are in our system that lead into uh, prison. Uh, I think we should be uh, very attentive to what happens to people when they are in prison, provide education programs, reduce recidivism rates, uh, provide reentry for people when they get out, give them uh, hope and uh, sense and of And the rest we're going to talk about next time yeah. we come together. Uh, I would love to reconvene at this time next year and see where, in fact, all of this has actually gone. But for now, with thanks to Ben Barlin and Elise Body, that's it 
for this edition of Due Process. But please, join us next week and every week for more cutting-edge issues of law and justice. And let us know what you think on our Facebook page, Due Process Law and Justice. And visit our website, dueprocesstv.rutgers.edu, where you'll also find our full Due Process archive for viewing on demand. For Sandy, producer Tanya Bentley, and all of us here, I'm Ray Brown. Thank you for watching. Every year we spend $80 billion to keep folks incarcerated. $80 billion. Now just to put that in perspective, for $80 billion we could have universal preschool for every three-year-old and four-year-old in America. For $80 billion we could double the salary of every high school teacher in America. For $80 billion we could finance new roads and new bridges and new airports job training programs, research and development. For what we spend to keep everyone locked up for one year, we could eliminate tuition at every single one of our public colleges and universities. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch us on demand on YouTube.